My name is Aisha Marable, and I am the Director of Community Engagement at the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. Nigeria Bailey, producer of tonight's event, and I welcome you on behalf of ADP, our funder, John Schreiber, our president and CEO, and the entire New Jersey Performing Arts Center family. You know, during the COVID pandemic, we have enjoyed bringing you programming in your living room, but we look forward to seeing you back at NJPAC really soon. We are delighted that you have joined us tonight and our community partner, Tim Chris, and the Newark History Society for an interesting and engaging virtual program, the debate over alcohol, hmm. temperance and prohibition in Newark. As Newark once was the home of many breweries and by 1900, there were more than 1200 bars, almost one on every corner. Debates over alcohol played out for decades in Newark's pulpit courtrooms and newspapers, culminating in prohibition and the 18th Amendment. We are in for a treat tonight. So sit back and enjoy the very special conversation. I wanna give a special thanks in advance to our dynamic panel that Tim will introduce. And we welcome you to engage in conversation with them by using your chat feature, raising your hand, and engaging in a dynamic dialogue yourself in that chat. Let's enjoy tonight's presentation. Well, thanks, Aisha. Um, I wanna add my welcome on behalf of the Newark History Society. Um, and this is the uh, 93rd public program that uh, the Newark History Society has um, sponsored since our founding uh, some 19 years ago. Uh, and we're especially pleased that NJ Pack is co-sponsoring and hosting uh, this one. So thank you, Aisha, and all your colleagues at NJ Pack for all that you do to um, engage the newer community. And I just wanna make sure that we're all showing up on the screen here. Uh, there we are, okay. Uh, so tonight's program, the, de the uh, debate over alcohol, temperance and prohibition in Newark, 1880 to 1930, uh, focuses on a topic that roiled Newark for decades. And we're um, fortunate to have uh, uh, three presenters, all of whom are members of our executive committee at the Newark History Society. And they will each make a brief presentation and then engage in a panel discussion as we take your questions. So as Aisha said, please um, add your questions to Zoom's Q&A function as we go along. Uh, Michelle Rotunda is gonna go first. Um, Michelle earned her PhD at Rutgers, New, uh, New Brunswick. Uh, and uh, she's an assistant professor of history at Union uh, County College. And her book, uh, A Drunkard's Defense, Alcohol, Murder and Medical Jurisprudence in 19th Century America was just published last February by University of Massachusetts Press. And she's gonna draw on some of the research that she did um, for that book that focuses on an incident in Newark. Uh, George Robb uh, will go next and uh, discuss the temperance movement in Newark. Uh, George, as many of you know, is a professor of history at William Patterson University, and he's currently working on a book about World War I uh, and Newark. And George will be followed by Laura Triano, who will describe the problems that Newark police had in, in um, enforcing prohibition. Um, Laura earned her PhD in American studies from Rutgers Newark, where she uh, uh, teaches the history of Newark course. And she's now the uh, acting director of the Honors College at Rutgers Newark. So Michelle, let's get started with you. Okay, let me get the uh, PowerPoint up here. Okay, you seeing that okay? Yes. Okay, so good evening. Um, 
So I've written on drunkenness as a defense to murder, and this is one of the cases I used to highlight the issue. And it is Newark resident, Robert Martin, who killed his wife and baby daughter in June of 1881 after an evening of drinking at local bars. The case does have some significance because of various appeals, um, attempts to gain a pardon from the governor, uh, and there's also commentary from the New Jersey Law Journal, as well as a renowned neurologist. The crime itself, unfortunately, was all too common, but it provides a good opportunity to discuss ideas about temperance, medicine, and the law as it connects to alcohol use. So I'm gonna share some of the details of the uh, crime with you, and I've tried to add some additional newer context uh, from what I did in the book to get a feel for attitudes towards alcohol and crime in the city. Oops, there we go. So on June 15th, 1881, Robert Martin, who lived on Nassau Street, which is where this blue arrow is here, and the street's actually not there anymore, um, was walking back from Eagle Rock. And he stopped somewhere along the way for a few glasses of ale with a friend. He was back in Newark around 5.30, and he stopped at McGuire's Saloon, a uh, neighborhood bar that's here at the corner of Nesbitt and uh, Morris and Essex, Essex and Morris Railroad Avenue. He continued drinking there. He had five or six brandies and a few glasses of gin going back and forth between McGuire's and Fuller Loves, which was on Nassau Street. He ended up at Fuller Loves a little after nine o'clock that evening where the owner told him he'd had enough and he told him to go home. So he returns home, he's on the same street. He lives on 86 Nassau Street. Robert was 50 years old. Uh, he was born in England. He lives there with his second wife, Sarah. She's 32 years old, also born in England and they've been married for 12 years. He has three sons from his first marriage. The youngest, Edward, is 16, and he lives with them. Uh, and they have three children together, all of whom are there that night. Charles, who is 11, 18-month-old Nellie, and six-month-old Florence. He gets home, he argues with his wife over the whereabouts of his son, Edward, and also purportedly about his drinking. During the course of the argument, Robert gets his pistol from a box in the bedroom. He follows his wife down the stairs. She's holding their 18-month-old, and he shoots three times. Sarah Martin dies immediately. The baby Nellie received what was described as two ghastly wounds in the abdomen, and she died several hours later. Martin was taken into police custody almost immediately, and he declared, oh, I am going to be hung. I have shot my wife. So what's typical of the sensationalism you'd find that characterizes the press in this period, Martin's crime was reported as one of the most appalling murders known in the annals of crime in this city. Alcohol-related crime, however, was not uncommon, and it did often affect women and families. And if you look at some general reporting in the papers around this time, uh, you can get a sense of just how pervasive. And these act articles were actually chosen just fairly randomly as a sampling. So in January that same year, this is earlier, you see a list of um, police items. Um, we've got the second items already. We have an altercation at Bruckner's Saloon on Bank Street, um, where we have uh, a fight broke out. Uh, Thomas Tive, Central Avenue, was found drunk, suffering from a severe cut on his head. We have another barroom brawl where John Hanley was struck in the head with a bottle. Got some old fashioned horse stealing in here too. Um, and then we have an example of uh, domestic violence uh, between Patrick Owen and his wife. Alcohol is not mentioned there, but again, domestic violence is fairly common. Uh, another interesting story that uh, was just a month uh, prior to this, again, to show some of the dangers uh, of alcohol to uh, particularly women, you have a hack driver who had two young girls who were um, characterized as being in a state of um, beastly drunkenness. And he had uh, applied them with whiskey. Somebody caught on to what was going, going on, and he supposedly had uh, planned for some you know, uh, immoral purposes for these girls. So that made the papers. And then this last one is interesting in this sort of, you know, man bites dog way. Um, we see here that it was um, an assault here uh, by a wife um, against her husband. And it starts off saying assaults on wives by brutal husbands are a frequent occurrence, but it's rarely a husband appears in court charging his wife. And she was described as being frequently drunk. So stories about drinking and domestic violence were certainly very common. Um, I had hoped when I, you know, went back to this uh, case to find more specific temperance commentary. I didn't find a lot in Newark, uh, but historically, as far as temperance, you know, Newark seemed to have the usual. They had a chapter of the Washingtonians earlier in the century, some religious temperance organizations. Uh, they had hosted a women's Christian temperance union meeting in 1876. And Martin's story did take on the classic temperance narrative, the idea of a good man ruined by alcohol. Early accounts of the crime focused on the shocking details of the crime contrasted with the supposedly happy home occupied by the Martins. 
Uh, the North Morning Register in particular had several editorials on the case. This one was just a few days after the murder. Um, you note that it mentions sort of the thrill of horror, which frankly sold a lot of papers. So they covered these crimes in detail. Um, but also we pity the man who allows himself to become such a slave to intoxicating drink that he loses all love for wife and child of any comfortable home with its humanizing influences. And continuing on, it notes the murderer rarely does his bloody work without the aid of some maddening stimulant. And you see this idea very common in temperance rhetoric that alcohol somehow shares some of the blame for the crime. On the one hand, this provides an argument for prohibition, temperance, the only way to stop um, these problems or to ban alcohol, but it also ends up providing uh, some rationale for the criminal's actions. So Martin's story was reported in what was in this era a familiar narrative of seemingly idyllic domestic life destroyed by alcohol. Martin's class and his background likely had something to do with this. A lot of the support for temperance prohibition was often tied in with nativist views and fears of immigrants you know, who abused alcohol. Martin, who had been born in England, um, had worked as a mechanic. He was quite well off. Um, it was noted he could support his family in comfortable circumstances even though he hadn't worked in several years. He was living off you know, whatever money he had in investments. The crime was described as taking place in a comfortable and what had been a happy home. The house on Nassau Street was described as a neat two-story frame house. The lower floor had a kitchen, a sitting room, and a small room in an extension. There were three bedrooms on the second floor. And it was said the entire house is furnished neatly and comfortably, the walls of the rooms being covered with nice pictures and shows that the people must have lived in a respectable manner. When not drinking, it was reported Robert was a caring family man, but when he drank, his wife, quote, being a temperate woman, was, of course, opposed to his drunken excesses. And unsurprisingly, the reality of their lives was more complicated. Uh, after Sarah and Robert married, the family lived in Cuba for a while, where Robert had charge of a railroad shop building and repairing locomotives in Guantanamo. After the murder, Sarah Martin's mother and sister recounted that he had treated his wife badly and beat her when they were in Cuba. And at one point, Sarah had actually come home uh, and to live with her mother in Newark. Someone like Sarah Martin wouldn't have had a lot of options. Um, one study of divorce records in this period does note intemperance was a deciding factor in over one quarter of American divorces. However, in this case, Robert came to get her after about a year and she went back to Cuba with him. Uh, the entire family returned to Newark about three years prior to the murder. During the trial, two of the sons also testified their father frequently abused their mother, and on one occasion a few months earlier, he had threatened to shoot her. So the trial was in October 1881, and it was widely covered. Martin was represented by ex-judge Caleb S. Titsworth, um, who put forth the defense of insanity, but he also suggested there was an exculpatory lack of intent. So the goal here was hopefully gets his client off for insanity, um, but you know that was a gamble. If that didn't work, the idea was you said that the drunkenness meant he couldn't form the intent required to commit first degree murder, which um, carried the death penalty, and that hopefully he could get second degree or even manslaughter or some sort of lower charge. Um, Titsworth said Martin had his faults, namely drinking, um, but among all those who knew him, he was generous, clever, gentlemanly, never hurting or wronging anyone. He also threw out as part of the defense that Martin was perhaps inordinately affected by the alcohol because he suffered from malaria. He said Martin had no memory of the events and he also claimed his actions were accidental. Uh, he was trying to earn his money there. Uh, apparently he was paid quite well. Insanity and intent were the crucial issues. Uh, a number of physicians testified for the defense. Dr. H.C. Hendry had known Martin for several years and he said he was suffering from chronic alcoholism and that his condition was not the direct effect of immediate drinking, meaning he wasn't just drunk, which would be no excuse to the crime. County physician Peter V. P. Hewlett said he spoke to Martin shortly after the crime and that then the prisoner identified himself as Champagne Charlie and began to sing. So in his opinion, he thought Martin showed signs of aberration of mind and basically acted like a crazy man. The prosecution led by Colonel G. N. Abiel countered the idea that Martin's behavior was due to anything more than just being drunk. And police surgeon Joshua Ware Reed also assured the jury this was nothing more than intoxication and there were no signs of insanity. It was reported that the jury initially was divided, that they stood at seven for murder in the first degree and five for murder in the second degree, before unanimously agreeing that Martin should be convicted of the more serious charge, which carried a penalty of death. Within months, however, supportive public sentiment swirled around Martin. 
In November of 1881, Reverend James Boyd Brady of the Central Methodist Episcopal Church preached a sermon titled The Kind Reprieve. He characterized Marin as, quote, another case of a real good fellow doomed by drink. And there was a petition that circulated requesting a commutation of his sentence. Um, it was supposedly signed by many of the grand jury that indicted Martin, all the jury that tried the case, almost every prominent lawyer in Essex County, many clergymen, and a host of the best citizens. An application for a writ of error was also filed in early 1882, um, based on two reasons. One was they said the word deliberate should have appeared in the indictment if he was going to be convicted of first degree murder, and it did not. Um, and the defense also took issue with Reed's testimony because when he recounted how um, Martin acted, he read from his notes and they said that gave the impression that he was behaving in a much more rational way than if he had used his actual um, words. So Martin's life was spared initially by a reprieve from Governor George C. Ludlow, just days before his scheduled hanging in March 1882. When the news got out, it was reported that, quote, on the streets, general satisfaction at the result was expressed on all hands, and many persons who never saw Robert Martin in their lives shook hands warmly and expressed hopes that the month of life granted to the poor man by the governor may be indefinitely extended. The New Jersey Law Journal also said news of the reprieve brought a sense of relief from an impending horror, the execution of a man whom the people cannot bring themselves to think morally deserves so dreadful a punishment. And the New Jersey Law Journal came out forcefully to say that this should have been murder in the second degree, not first degree. Despite numerous efforts um, over the next uh, year or so to obtain a new trial or a commutation of sentence for Martin, his execution was ultimately scheduled for January 1884. And it would coincide with that of another murderer, James Graves. Graves had murdered 13-year-old Eddie Sodden, a neighborhood boy. Uh, but this one seemed likely a case of mental illness and no um, alcohol was involved here. Graves was often described as an imbecile and more problematically an infidel. Now, as Graves' attorneys mounted a last chance bid to obtain a pardon just days before his hanging, they called on Edward C. Spitzka to examine their client. Spitzka was a renowned neurologist who had testified just recently that Charles Guiteau, who had assassinated President James Garfield, was insane. And Spitzka believed Graves was insane, and he derided the public support for Martin. He couldn't believe that when this went before the Court of Pardons that they unanimously denied the petition for Graves, yet they were split on the one for Martin. But he does observe, observe that it may be said in their behalf that they correctly represented the popular sentiment, which was indifferent regarding Graves, while the sentimental part of the community made itself heard in numerous petitions on behalf of Martin, and visits of morbidly inclined females to the jail. And I wish I knew a little bit more about that, but I don't. <laughs> For Spitzka, Graves represented a case of legitimate insanity. Martin, who we saw as drunk, did not. It didn't help either Graves or Martin that there was a growing backlash against the insanity defense at this time. On January 3rd, 1884, both men were hanged in the courtyard of the old Essex County Jail. Martin had continued to hope for a last minute pardon, but none came. And despite his calm manner walking to the gallows, it was said his struggles were fearful. He had apparently freed one of his hands as he was hanging and was attempting to loosen the rope around his neck. And you see some reporting on that in the second article. He was buried in Fairmount Cemetery off Central Avenue next to the wife and child he had killed. So that's just one example of crime and alcohol in Newark um, alongside this sort of you know, complicated temperance narrative that often viewed alcohol as an accomplice to crime. Happy to answer questions later on and I look forward to hearing from my fellow speakers. And let me... Great. Um, so my um, talk, I put the question mark in, right? The temperance movement in Newark, um, because Newark is usually associated with breweries and with opposition to prohibition, we don't usually associate Newark with opposition to alcohol uh, consumption. 
But Newark also had a strong progressive and reform tradition that associated drinking with crime and corruption. And Michelle, I think, has done a great job of tracing out some of the ways in which this would play out um, at the time, some of these associations with uh, alcohol and, uh, and crime or um, wife abuse and uh, things like this. Um, temperance activism in Newark, uh, like America as a whole, was concentrated in two eras, the early 1800s and the early 1900s, or the late, late 1800s, early 1900s. See, my slides are not advancing. Hmm, I wonder why that is. That's trying to do. Great, I'm sorry about that. For some reason, the slides were not advancing, but, um, well, okay. Um, this image from Newark in the 1820s gives you a sense that, you know, Newark was not yet a big city. Industry was just beginning. Uh, the town was surrounded by farms. Indeed, there were farms within Newark's borders. Uh, most Newarkers were Protestants and the influence of Puritan morality was still quite strong. Uh, there were not many taverns in the town and, and there were serious legal restrictions on the sale of alcohol uh, in Newark. Yeah, I don't know what's wrong, but my slides are not advancing. I have them up, George, if you want okay. to continue. Great, I will continue. And can people hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so um, Newark took part uh, in the religious revivals that shook America during the early 1800s, the so-called Second Great Awakening. Uh, the First Great Awakening had been during the colonial period. Uh, these religious revivals centered on evangelical Protestantism and a call for repentance and salvation. Uh, temperance, or the total abstinence from alcohol consumption, was a centerpiece of religious revivals. People were invited to accept Jesus as their savior and to take the pledge, giving up intoxicating beverages. Um, next slide. Great. Um, so this, this image of taking the pledge, this is one that was wide, this particular image was widely distributed in Newark uh, by the Washingtonians. Uh, who are Baptist sect, uh, Michelle mentioned them, but they were, a, a, um, a temperance was a big, um, um, big part of what they stood for. And you can see, right, the, the, the man who is clearly the drunkard is signing the pledge. Um, his wife is thanking God that this is happening. And the, um, um, the implication of the illustration is that the father's alcohol consumption has impoverished uh, his family, but now that a new leaf is, uh, is being turned over. During the 1840s, Newark actually had two separate 
uh, temperance newspapers, the Newark Temperance Star and the Newark Temperance Advocate. So clearly temperance was, um, was, was a, um, a big phenomenon in Newark. Um, uh, next. Uh, temperance had widespread support among Newark's churches and among the city's elite, most notably uh, Theodore Frelinghuysen. Uh, he practiced law in Newark. He was a mayor of Newark during the 1830s and of course a long serving uh, senator from New Jersey. Uh, Frelinghuysen was also president of the American Bible Society and he was a very strong advocate of temperance. Um, now temperance is strongly associated with American Protestantism uh, so much so, uh, next. So much so that we forget there was a moment in the early 19th century in which many Irish Catholics supported temperance. Uh, in Ireland in the 1830s, Father Theobald Matthew led a hugely popular and very successful temperance movement. Um, again, something we don't usually associate with Ireland. Uh, Father Matthew was probably the most famous Irishman in the decades before the famine with the exception of Daniel O'Connell, the political leader. Um, Father Matthew was much admired by Irish Americans. And one of his biggest disciples in America was Father Patrick Moran of Newark. I've been able to locate an image of him, but this is his parish church, St. John's of Newark, which of course is still standing. Uh, and he was uh, the rector there for 30 years from 1833 to 1866. Uh, Moran was uh, hugely, um, important in building uh, Catholic community, especially Irish Catholic community in Newark. He's responsible for the building of St. Patrick's Newark that became the first uh, cathedral. And Father Moran also spearheaded a huge temperance revival among Irish Catholics in Newark during the 1840s, in which many Irish Catholics in Newark uh, signed the pledge, or as I said, took Father Moran's pledge. Now this early, this early temperance movement among uh, Protestants and also among uh, Catholics in Newark um, never completely disappeared, but it lost its power and influence as America grew in size and diversity. Uh, next. You can contrast this image of Newark in the 1870s with the earlier one from the 1820s. By the late 19th century, Newark had uh, been radically transformed from a sleepy agricultural community to a large crowded industrial city. Newark was no longer a Protestant town dominated by people of British heritage. Newark was a city of immigrants, most of whom were Catholics and Jews, and hostility to alcohol consumption was not part of their ethnic heritage, except, except for this, this, this moment, this moment in the 1830s and 40s when some Irish Catholics did take part in it. You don't see this uh, happening later in the, this later temperance movement that I'll, that I'll discuss. Uh, restrictions on the sale of alcohol had been greatly liberalized in Newark from the 1850s on. And even laws forbidding the sale of alcohol on Sunday were openly flouted by the late 1800s. And in some cases, um, selling alcohol on Sunday, you'd get fined $10 for doing so. And it was much cheaper just to pay that fine because bars could make a lot more than $10 selling alcohol on Sunday. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Newark was also a city of breweries. You see here Ballantines on the Passaic River uh, as being one of, one of several. Uh, Newark was probably the most important center of beer production in America after St. Louis, St. Louis and Milwaukee. Uh, and the breweries employed many Newarkers, especially German Americans. Uh, next slide. Newark was um, certainly a city of bars and saloons. By 1900, there were more than 1,200 saloons in Newark, almost one on every corner. Uh, they often served as neighborhood social centers for Newark's many ethnic communities. And this is Nicodemi's, an Italian wine bar in the old First Ward. Uh, now, a revived temperance movement developed in America in the late 1800s. Uh, and this temperance movement, this late, this temperance movement of the late 1800s was mostly centered in small towns and villages of the Midwest and the South. It was strongest among Protestants of British descent. Temperance advocates looked with horror at America's big cities, which they saw as places of political corruption, crime, and moral disorder, uh, and teeming with unruly immigrants. Uh, the production and consumption of alcohol were blamed 
for much of this corruption and disorder uh, and crime. Uh, next. The revived temperance movement of the late 1800s was dominated by women. Uh, women were very much involved in the, in the uh, temperance movement of the, uh, the early 1800s, but they did not lead it and dominate it as much as they did as this, uh, in the later temperance movement. Um, its most famous organization was the WCTU, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, founded in the Midwest in 1873. By 1900, it had 150,000 members nationwide. This made it the largest women's group uh, in America, indeed one of the largest organizations of any kind in the United States. The white uh, ribbon was its symbol, uh, symbol of purity. Uh, temperance advocates were often referred to as white ribboners. There was a whole separate temperance subculture which developed in the late 1800s in the early 20th century with its own newspapers, books, music, restaurants, hotels, and resorts. Uh, Ocean Grove on the Jersey Shore was a temperance uh, summer resort um, locally. Uh, soft drinks, uh, which we're all familiar with today, were originally marketed in the United States as temperance beverages. Uh, next slide. All right, Emma Bourne, she's completely forgotten today. She doesn't appear in any of the standard Newark history. She doesn't even appear in any of the recent biographical uh, collections of famous Newarkers. And yet in her day, she was one of the most famous Newarkers with a national and international reputation. Uh, Bourne succeeded her mother, Mary Hill, as leader of the Newark WCTU. Uh, from the 1890s. So Newark did have a branch of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, although Newark was certainly not a, a center of temperance activism at this time, it did have some people who were very active in the movement and Emma Bourne uh, being the most famous New Jersey and in fact, one of the most famous Americans in the temperance movement uh, at this time. Uh, from 1891 to 1910, uh, Bourne was the state president of the New Jersey WCTU. She was a compelling speaker and an energetic organizer. Uh, she greatly expanded the group throughout the state. By the late 1890s, the New Jersey WCTU was growing faster than any other state chapter in the United States. Uh, Bourne even created a small publishing company to produce temperance literature at the third of the cost uh, charged by commercial printers. So she's really a very enterprising person. Now, support for the WCTU in Newark came predominantly from white middle-class Protestant women in the Forest Hill and Roseville neighborhoods. Those were the, the fancy neighborhoods in Newark at the time. There was next to no support for the WCTU in Newark's immigrant neighborhoods in the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, next slide. But there was very strong support from African-American women and the black churches in Newark. Uh, the New Jersey Federation of Colored Women's Clubs was founded in 1915 specifically as a temperance organization. It very quickly branched out to support other causes like women's suffrage or uh, causes uh, anti-segregation um, and anti-discrimination. The Reverend Florence Spearing Randolph, she was a minister of the AME Zion Church. Uh, she was the, uh, the first president for many years, the president of this organization. Um, she um, was the uh, minister of an AME Zion church in Newark uh, at one point, but she also was uh, pastored uh, AME Zion, Zion churches in several towns uh, in New Jersey uh, during this period. So, I mean, that, I, I think this is important that uh, although temperance is not very strong among Newark's immigrant communities, it was not just an organization of white, uh, a, a movement of white women, but it was a movement of white women um, some white women uh, and um, uh, Protestant white women, but also of, of black women. Although interestingly enough, the movement like so much else during the period was segregated. There wasn't a lot of give and take or cooperation between the white women and black women, but they were, they were going at temperance uh, uh, among their own communities, uh, but without a lot of coordination uh, with each other. Um, um, next. Um, there was, Newark was also, uh, there was also a, a movement for progressive reform in Newark and support for temperance also came from progressive campaigns against prostitution 
gambling and drug addiction. So this report on the social evil conditions in Newark, New Jersey is a very interesting report that was issued in 1914. It was essentially a study of prostitution in Newark. Social evil was a kind of a euphemism of the time for prostitution. And this 19, uh, 1914 report documented widespread prostitution in Newark that was based in the saloons. Um, with active support for bar from bartenders. So if you, if you wanted to find a prostitute, you would go to a bar. And, and often some of these bars and saloons in Newark had rooms attached or rooms upstairs where you could take a prostitute. So again, this, this implication that, it, that um, the drinking wasn't just bad in and of itself, but it, it was associated with other kinds, of, um, other kinds of social problems like prostitution or drug addiction. Uh, you could buy you know, cocaine in bars, that was something that the report documented, uh, and gambling was also often associated uh, in bars as well. So this idea that people in the temperance movement saw saloons as sort of dens of iniquity. Um, there was not a lot of, um, not a, not a lot of uh, gray area here. Uh, next, next slide, please. But it's really World War I, which is what gave temperance its biggest boost and finally enabled prohibition to take effect. Uh, alcohol was seen as the enemy of wartime efficiency. Uh, alcohol was also seen as a threat to the health and purity of American servicemen. It was against the law in the United States during World War I to serve drinks to soldiers or sailors. So for the armed services, there was prohibition uh, during World War I. Uh, where, and this, of course, also made the association that alcohol was bad, that you know, the healthy and uh, noble young men who are fighting for democracy, we need to protect them. Uh, from alcohol and the evils of alcohol. Wartime food conservation also restricted the availability of grains for alcohol production. This is, you know, uh, you had voluntary um, uh, food restraint during World War I, but, you know, we need, there were two, two million American soldiers serving in France. We needed to feed them. We were, um, United States was providing a lot of food to our allies, especially to England and France. And so, uh, all, all the grain that was used to make beer or to make other alcohol, that was so much less grain available for bread uh, production um, during the war. Uh, next slide. Uh, the temperance advocates branded the breweries as unpatriotic for producing beer during wartime. Some people suspected that German American brewers were anti-American or even pro-German. I mean, there's no evidence for this, but these are the kind of allegations that were made during the war. These are uh, two advertisements uh, from the time from Newark newspapers that are sort of typical that emphasized how wasteful it was to spend money on drink during wartime. And they would, for example, point out, you know, New Jerseyans spend this much money on alcohol in a given year, and that money could be better spent on buying war bonds, or that money could pay for so many submarines, or so many warships uh, to fight against. Uh, Germany uh, during the war. Uh, next slide, please. So Newark's breweries were running scared. The liquor industry in New Jersey and in Newark was quite frightened by all of this. They needed to assert their patriotism and counter the growing support to restrict or eliminate alcohol production. So Bevo is one example. This is a non-alcoholic energy drink, probably the first energy drink. Uh, that was made by Anheuser-Busch, which had a brewery in Newark and an office in Newark. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, uh, it's pushing this new beverage, which really, frankly, never caught on uh, as a patriotic drink. And it's, look, look, the breweries are not, you know, just wasting grain. The breweries are also doing this, you know, making this, this healthy drink for, for the soldiers. Um, and they also, the breweries are also trying to associate prohibition with communism. So the second, the second ad from the Newark papers makes a point that, uh, of course, uh, the Russian Revolution had just taken place, the Bolsheviks had taken over. And so this, uh, this advertisement says, well, one of the first thing the Bolsheviks did when they took over Russia was they, they ended alcohol production. So it's like, you know, prohibition is a communist, it's a communist idea. It's not something that we want, uh, that we want in a democracy. Uh, next slide. And then uh, Feigenspan Brewery, uh, Christian Feigenspan was one of Newark's biggest breweries, took out a whole series of ads in Newark newspapers and, and newspapers also in other New Jersey cities about why I drink beer. There's a whole series of these. And so you've got the factory worker who says he drinks beer to steady his nerves. You've got the old folks who say that 
that it has tonic properties, that beer strengthen, strengthens them. There's a, you know, I just gave you these two examples. There's also one of a nursing mother who's saying that beer is good for her, you know, beer is good for her baby. Uh, you know, so this is the whole idea that beer was a healthy drink. Now these, this whole series of ads of why I drink beer was just too much for the temperance community uh, in Newark at the time. Uh, next slide. And the temperance people took out this counter ad on why I don't drink beer, in which they have cite a number of medical authorities on why beer is really unhealthy. And one doctor who says beer makes you stupid. Uh, so, you know, they, they, they were quick to counter uh, this really very desperate attempt on the part of, of the breweries to try to halt um, prohibition. Um, next slide. But it's really wartime grain shortages that were used to gain support in Congress for a prohibition amendment. So this 18th amendment to the constitution to make the production, transport and sale of intoxicating uh, liquors illegal. What an intoxicating liquor was, was not spelled out. And there was some confusion and debate over this. And a number of politicians thought that this probably only referred to hard liquor, like you know uh, whiskey or gin and that it, that it would not include beer or wine. So there were some people who supported an 18th Amendment, Prohibition Amendment, thinking that beer and wine would be, uh, would be exempted from this. Uh, Congress uh, passed the 18th Amendment, December 18th, 1917. It was sent to the states for ratification. You needed 36 states uh, to ratify. Uh, finally, on January 16th, 1919, you had the requisite number of states. Um, New Jersey, as you can see, did not ratify. The dark colored states are the ones that ratified. So New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, Connecticut. Uh, there was, of course, very strong Northeast uh, uh, sentiment against prohibition for all kinds of reasons, but certainly uh, the liquor industry was very uh, much centered um, in some of these places. Um, and you notice also by the time that the uh, Amendment was ratified, the war was over. So this whole, the wartime emergency that had uh, pushed the 18th Amendment through by the time it was ratified, the war was no longer in place, but prohibition was now uh, in place. It wasn't quite clear what exactly this would mean. Uh, next slide. But Congress passed the Volstead Act in October 1919 to clear up some of the ambiguities. And one of the things that the Volstead Act uh, pointed out uh, or defined was that intoxicating liquors would include beer and wine. And so a lot of Newarkers and New Jerseyans felt that they had, that a bait and switch had taken place, that some people, uh, some politicians uh, supported uh, the 18th Amendment uh, on the belief that it would not include beer and wine. And now it was made clear that it would include beer and wine. Um, the Volstead Act defined the date at which prohibition would go into effect, January 17th, 1920. And you see some uh, federal agents uh, pouring alcohol down a drain. Uh, the Volstead Act also gave teeth to the enforcement of it, gave the federal government considerable powers enforcing prohibition because the fear was that certain states like New Jersey that hadn't voted for it wouldn't do much about enforcement so that the federal government was given these powers. Okay, that's, I'm gonna end there and you can turn it over to, uh, um, um, our next presenter, Laura. Thanks, George. You leave us in a perfect place. So I'm gonna share my screen now. Okay. All right. So depending on who you ask, the feds, the rum runners, the guys slinging bathtub gin in a speakeasy, anywhere between 40 to 70% of all illegal liquor coming into the United States totally uh, during prohibition, which George said began in 1920, ended in 1933, flowed through Newark. Newark had it all. I mean, all of you know this. It's an urban East Coast democratic city with a large and active port. It has um, a neighbor. It's a smallish island. It's fairly well populated called Manhattan. Um, it has an extensive rail system. And as George was telling us, we have a large scale breweries that had an enthusiastic population to keep them in business. 
What attracted me personally to bootlegging were the stories, stories that my great grandparents and grandparents used to tell us about their associations with some local families in Brooklyn, you know, like the Gambinos and the Genovese. And then I arrived in Newark and I started to hear some more stories uh, like the two pictured here, one about Richie the Boot and some Yankee named Joe. I mean, you know, he's not famous or anything like that. Um, and Dutch Schultz and his fatal bathroom visit on East Park Street. Uh, we have Abner Longies Woolman and Joe Reinfeld and Colonel Ivor Reeves. And my problem for tonight was that I only had a few minutes to talk and a lot of stories I can tell. So I was tasked with discussing the problems with enforcing prohibition, though I'm not really sure if we can consider it a problem when there wasn't all that many people trying to do it. Um, the 18th Amendment, as George was saying, was not ratified in New Jersey until 1922, and it was a bitterly contested two-year fight, um, primarily between the dry Republicans and the wet Democrats. And even after ratification, politicians openly defied the law by drinking at public events. Uh, and New Jersey's governor, Edward Edwards, campaigned on the slogan, quote, New he wanted to make New Jersey as wet as the Atlantic Ocean, and then went on to say, I intend to interfere with the enforcement of prohibition in this state. So he didn't leave a lot of nuance uh, in his campaign. And our Newark mayor, Thomas Raymond, actually also ran in that race, and he ran as the lone wet Republican candidate. And like most East Coast cities, as you can see from Georgia's map, Newark in particular with its large immigrant population, there wasn't a ton of popular support uh, for prohibition. And then of course we get to law enforcement. So I'm gonna start with the two men who I believe are essentially the main contributors to Newark's inability to keep dry. And that's Longest Woman and Joe Reinfeld. And I, as I previously mentioned, there are plenty of others, but these guys to me, they really run the show. Longy is arguably one of the East Coast's most powerful bootleggers. Uh, he dropped out of school at 13 to help su supplement his family's income. And on Broom Street, he found work first as a vegetable peddler, and then he moved to small-time gambling operations. When the government enacted prohibition, always looking for the next opportunity, he traded in his horse and wagon and hired himself as a transport to protect the guard shipments. Um, and you did not want to attempt to hijack Longy's uh, on these trucks, um, often you were shot up immediately. Um, his crew, they drove Mack Bulldog AC models trucks that were originally built for World War I. Um, they were ar literally armored vehicles. Um, and if not for trucks, they did large Studebakers or sedans. Um, and the rear seats were removed and they souped up their six cylinder engines. And they were equipped with spotlights to blind pursuers. They had chains in the back to blind people with clouds of dust. And you even used their license plates. So you knew your bootlegger by their license plates. So you would stop along the street and then you would buy your liquor right from the car, which I find to be very convenient. So Joe Reinfeld controlled the vast majority of all liquor entering into the United States, and most of it came through Newark's ports, and much of it came from the Canadian islands of Miquelon and St. Pierre. Um, so boats would anchor 12 miles out, out in international waters, that's the, the line, out on the Jer Jersey shore, um, and it was known as Rum Row. So, and I've seen reports of women standing on the decks of those boats, holding competitive price signs so you would know which boat would come to go to and which to get the best price. Um, you know, so the speed boats would have to, you know, pull up to make those purchases. So they would have to either out Fox or out speed or essentially overpay the Coast Guard in order to get back and forth. And these are some of the boats and some of the, you know, fires and explosions and, you know, chases and the real McCoy comes out of uh, these boats. So Reinfeld hired Longy to transport his shipments from the docks to the warehouses where they could be distributed throughout the city. So while working for Reinfeld, Longy began his own bootlegging operation and he soon became Reinfeld's chief rival. He was good at what he did. So Reinfeld realized that it would be more lucrative to concede to Longy's demand of 50% of his business than to actually compete with him. And according to the IRS, between 1928 and 1933, Reinfeld and Longy made $40 million in liquor sales alone. So it was a big time business. The Coast Guard was not the only agency on the payroll, of course. Um, so one story that I read takes place on Prince Street Warehouse, in, on Prince Street in a warehouse after midnight. 
And the story revolves around James Rutkin, um, who was a childhood friend of, and an associate of Wongi's. And he was overseeing the unloading of a liquor when two plainclothes detectives make a visit. And they say to him, you the boss here? He says, yeah, what's up? And they say, you're under arrest. And he's like, for what? Storing illegal liquor. And Rutkin goes, you must be out of your fucking mind. Do you know who rents this warehouse? And they say to him, I don't give a shit if Calvin Coolidge rents it, wise guy. So of course they didn't know who rented it. And if they did, they wouldn't have bothered to charge him. Uh, the following afternoon in the courthouse, it was crowded with people and everyone seemed to know Rutkin. The lawyers, the clerks, the officers, hey Rutkin, you know, as he comes into the courthouse. So Ruckin's lawyer says, Your Honor, I can give you 500 reasons why my client should be on the street right now. Uh, we heard to my chambers it was followed by case dismissed. So Ruckin emerges with $500 less than he entered, but he did save the court the trouble of misplacing his paperwork. And on this slide, we have actual FBI files on Ruckin's attempt to actually extort money from Joe Reinfeld. Um, so, and there's plenty of court testimony um, from these trials and they're well worth a read if you are interested um, in prohibition and particularly in Longy and James Ruckin. So I really got interested in prohibition and law enforcement through Colonel Ira Reeves, and he was the director of the New Jersey Prohibition Bureau, which was headquartered in uh, 1060 Broad Street. And he knew plenty about the hard times the court had with their paperwork. He described the legal department, quote, as anyone with a smattering of legal knowledge can see how evidence of a perfectly good case could be so bungled as to defeat the ends of justice, that it is often purposely bungled in such a manner that cannot be disputed, end quote. Reeves had served in the army in the Spanish-American War, the Philippine-American War, and in World War I. Uh, he was wounded several times. He is also the recipient of a Distinguished Service Medal. And from September 1926 to May 1927, he had the in unenviable task of trying to make one of, if not the wettest states in the country, not be dry, maybe moist, possibly damp. I mean, it doesn't actually matter because he didn't get remotely close uh, to either. He chronicles his time as director in the very entertaining Old Rum River revelations of a, a prohibition administrator. Uh, and he begins with delusion. I mean, literally, he begins with delusion. It's the first word that he writes in the book. And he goes on with, quote, the illusion was not long with me. Instead of being merely in a dream, I soon found out I was in a nightmare reality. Before long, I found myself in a whirlpool of disloyalty, intrigue, espionage, within and without service, graft, lack of support from Washington, lack of sympathy of the public, double crossing everywhere, cutthroat tactics on the part of those for whom I had every reason and right to expect support from the top down, from the bottom up." End quote. Um, and I can understand his frustration because the turnover rate within the Prohibition Bureau was 25% and the Bureau itself was considered essentially a training ground for future bootleggers. You'd find out what the tactics are of your police and then you know, you'd make contacts when you were arresting people. Um, and then you would be able to get into business. Um, so it was a, a smart career move um, if you wanted to get into the bootlegging business. So when he resigned, Reeves complained that there was no public sympathy for prohibition or for those who attempted to enforce it. And among crowds of onlookers during raids, um, and there's all kinds of stories about what they were up to um, when a raid was going on, there was no thank yous essentially sent in his direction. Um, in fact, some onlookers tend to have something else in mind. And he recounts one such instance. Um, so I'm going to read it to you. This is a pretty famous photo. Um, so you might know a version of this particular story. So an officer calls him um, to say that they have stopped a freight train that has a bunch of beer on it uh, within the city limits of Newark. So he goes to say, I had not witnessed such a capture, but it was reported to me over the phone. And I was asked for instructions as to what the disposition to make of the contraband. It had been in our practice 
in the past when a seizure of this kind was made within city limits to haul the beer into the city dump, break the heads of the barrel, and after emptying them, burn them. In this particular case, the agent in charge informed me that there was a large vacant lot in the back of the railroad yards where the seizure had been made. I asked him, could the destruction take place there? And he said, it could. What I did not know is when the instructions were given was that the yard was bounded by a dense industrial population. Shortly after the agents began unloading the barrels of beer, a large and obviously thirsty crowd assembled and began to take the barrels away from the federal men. The prohibition forces soon found themselves overwhelmed and they were absolutely helpless. The crowd overran the lot and were soon engaged in rolling the barrels to the nearest street where they were quickly loaded into waiting trucks and passenger automobiles and hurried away. Seeking relief, one of the agents excitedly called the office. We immediately responded with six or eight men. And since we had judged from the alarm that a riot was taking place, we took sawed off shotguns with us. When we arrived at the scene with our shotguns, it was amusing to see how quickly the crowd had scattered without any threatening gestures on our part. And it was not necessary to make the threats for the very sight of the shotguns was sufficient. This instance taught me a lesson, never sanction the destruction of any quantity of beer in the presence of a large crowd, especially on a hot sweltering day. And I think that probably is a good lesson for all of us. Um, and we can't know the full impact of the inability to enforce prohibition that it had on Newark, whether the residents saw their politicians as criminals for opening defying the laws or that they were taking reasonable action against something that was unlawful. We don't know if the lucrative deals officers received from bootleggers were seen as undermining public trust or as an inevitable response to the reality on the streets. We do know that some of the money made by numerous criminal enterprises did sustain some communities and neighborhoods in the following years of the Depression. We know, as Michelle has told us, there were murders and crimes committed that destroyed families. We know that there was plenty of new technologies and ingenious tools and operations that were spurred from the era. People got very clever um, and how to move liquor around. And we knew, and we know for sure that it produced uh, a lot of really interesting stories. So I'm excited to have uh, the panel discussion with uh, Michelle and George and with all of you um, to talk more about prohibition in all of its forms. So thanks everyone. Great, thanks so much, uh, Michelle and George and, and Laura. And why don't we start with, if you have a question for each other based on um, your presentations and how they link together. I have a question for Michelle. Uh, do we know if it was more regional, um, like the use of alcohol as an excuse for murder or was it like across the United States, it's like rural or urban spaces more likely to use it as their defense? It was everywhere. It was, um, it was just, yeah, especially by mid 19th century because there had been some um, successful uh, defenses based on insanity. Um, by the time you get past mid century, you had moral insanity, which really just kind of expanded the definition. Um, and then also when you start having the degrees of murder, which change state by state, um, but when you start seeing that, everybody's also throwing that in. So it wasn't uncommon to have, you know, a defense based on insanity and then also try to say there was no intent and get a lesser degree. It was something you used only, you know, if it was clear you were guilty, <laughs> obviously, um, but usually, you know, when uh, mostly drunk men kill their wives, it's pretty clear that they did it. They're standing there drunk and bloody, you know, um, but yeah, it, it was common everywhere. And as soon as you saw any of the states start instituting the uh, different degrees of murder, you saw that um, drunkenness was always, um, uh, in cases of drunkenness, they always used the uh, sort of lesser degree also to try to um, save themselves from being executed. I guess I have a question for Laura. Um, would you say that this is this is just evidence that you can't really enforce a law in any given locality if the if there's no support for it among the local population and the it politicians? Seems, it seems so. I mean, there was no wide scale you know, support of this law. I mean, and it wasn't only that these prohibition officers were making three thousand dollars a year and can make three thousand dollars like a a month on the street, you know, it was 
everybody was drinking and everybody was the politician, you know, as you were talking through, like it's a part of culture that people did not want to relinquish and did not want to be policed over. Um, so yeah, I don't think if the law is that unpopular, I don't know if it's sustainable to maintain that. Or is that the case? I can I could give you an example from the 18th century. Same thing. And if the <laughs> if the population doesn't support it, they're they're uh, going to find a way to uh, avoid it. Uh, Michelle uh, Gordon Bond points out that it was Hannibal <laughs> Goodwin who uh, who uh, accompanied um, uh, uh, Mr. Martin to the uh, to the gallows. So yeah, he had visited him at the jail actually quite frequently and was one of sort of, you know, uh, many who supported him and had hoped for the commutation of his sentence. Yeah. George, uh, before prohibition, is, is Gail Malmgren's asking if there's evidence that the temperance movement ever affected the sale of alcohol beverages significantly in Newark. Um, I don't think, not, not in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, in the earlier period, I think there is, um, and I, uh, I'm, I'm more familiar with the, the, situ the actual situation in Ireland, for example, where in the 1830s, there was a huge drop in tax revenue from alcohol because the temperance movement was so successful there. So, I mean, that's the way you try to measure it because alcohol is heavily taxed by governments. And so and there is evidence in places in the United States uh, including New Jersey, where there is a fall in revenue from uh, in the early 1800s as a result of some of these, whether Newark, I don't have that information for Newark, but it wouldn't surprise me if there was some fall off. But, you know, it's very temporary. It, it tends to be these moments. Uh, and Keith uh, Delaney is asking if Newark's reputation as a home to a great number of speakeasies uh, had any significant effect on the on the way the local courts looked at the use of alcohol as a defense? Did did city politicians push judges to steer clear of of uh, adjudications uh, blaming alcohol use? Um, sounds like his use of the word speakeasies makes me think of of prohibition, whereas the um, uh, adjudications blaming alcohol use uh, makes me think more of of, of your topic about uh, domestic abuse and that sort of thing. But how did the courts handle uh, 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 complaints or arrests related to uh, rum running or, or, or uh, avoiding prohibition? Laura? Yeah, so the court testimonies that I have read um, don't look particularly favorably at, you know, the rum runners. Um, there's not like, you know, an obvious like you know overrun of the court system that all of them got off um but you see like with the case of james ruckin whose case went all the way up to the supreme court um in new jersey that there's quite a lot of space where they're able to get off on all kinds of different types of charges who was paying for their lawyers or who was paying for whatever you know the problem with crime history as i'm sure michelle can attest to too is they don't keep excellent records um, of the crimes as they are committing them so you're trying to follow the paper trail of different types of criminals and you know the stories that they're telling you know later on so there's not like wide scale like everybody gets off um but there's not like wide scale everyone's in jail either um so i think it's probably the, like the support and prohibition itself. And, and over the whole period, the, the, the 50 years and such, is there a, a difference in, in how the public um, or the courts or the police handled um, uh, the uh, beer and wine versus spirits? Um, That's a big question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't know if there's a discernible difference. There's different people running the different types of alcohol. Um, and it was it was still legal to brew beer. Um, it just had to be near beer. But to get to near beer, most of the time you had to brew the beer and then de-alcoholize it. So some of that beer, not surprisingly, you know, <laughs> maybe you know got on a truck. You know, maybe you know ended up at a warehouse to be distributed or on a train. So I think it's harder in some cases to prosecute that because it's not illegal in which to do it. Um, that's yeah. I mean that that earlier question I think it's interesting um, about um, the courts and alcohol during prohibition and I know that's not something that any of us were prepared to talk about 
but that would be interesting, you know, if during the period of prohibition, people committed crimes while they were drunk, could there be any way to, you know, like, oh, my client was drunk and was impaired. Well, you know, that that's a kind of defense that was used a lot, mm -hmm. but under prohibition, you're not supposed to be drinking at all. So I don't know, would that defense even be allowed in court? It's just a, that's an interesting question, but yeah, I don't know if anyone's done any work on that. Yeah, I don't know that period. I'd assume in theory, because they let a lot of things speak to intent. So if you were just using it for the intent part of it, I would assume it would still be allowable. But um, yeah, to be fair, I haven't really looked at the later period. And by that time, the insanity defense was almost never used because that had really fallen out of favor quite a bit, so. Um, George, to go to your presentation and, and um... This comes from um, Nell Urban Painter via Glenn Schaefer. And that, talk a little bit more about the relationship between uh, prohibition and women's suffrage, which uh, um, yeah. she also so, I mean, thought that it's the woman's A-N rather than E-N, Christian Temperance Union. But uh, um, anyway, uh, prohibition and, and, and suffrage, a number of the, uh, certainly um, the Reverend Sperling that you uh, showed it was discussed earlier in our program about um, uh, uh, women's suffrage. And so yeah, she was a big advocate of women's suffrage. Um, that when the um, the uh, the WCTU came out in favor of women's suffrage early in the 20th century, and I don't remember the exact year, but it was a huge boost to the suffrage movement in the United States because they were such a big organization. They had huge amounts of money. They had on the ground organization all over the place. So there was a strong association between suffrage and temperance. And um, that was also something that led to anti-suffrage in New Jersey. Now, that's something I pointed out in an earlier presentation I did on the anti-suffrage movement uh, in um, New Jersey. When New Jersey had, when New, the state of New Jersey had a referendum in 1915 on whether or not to give women the vote, it was re resoundly defeated in New Jersey. And Newark had the biggest anti-suffrage vote of any place in New Jersey. And a big part of it was the liquor industry, because the liquor industry was very fearful that if women got the vote, they would bring in suffrage. And that wasn't a crazy fear. That wasn't an irrational fear. But I think that's part of the reason that the suffrage, the uh, opposition to suffrage diminished uh, after World War I, because at that point, prohibition was already in. So, and it, prohibition had been brought in by a male controlled Congress. So you could no longer say, oh, let's not give women the vote because they'll bring in to bring in prohibition, well, prohibition already happened. So that one of the main oppositions to women's suffrage was no longer there. But the uh, this the separation between uh, uh, the advocacy by white women and black women was the same for uh, on temperance as it was on suffrage. I think or you know I, that's a good question. And you know, to be honest, uh, I haven't looked that closely at how it might or might not have worked in temperance. Um, Certainly in suffrage, you had a lot of segregation, but, but later by, by, the, um, by the, the, you know, the 1910s, you had more cooperation. And certainly in New Jersey, you had Lillian Feichert, who actually went to, to Florence Randolph and asked her to join the executive board. And so you actually had, um, you had greater cooperation between white and black women in New Jersey over the issue of suffrage uh, in the 1910s and beyond. Uh, whether you had some of that with temperance, I'm just not as familiar with that. I suspect there were moments when you might have, but probably not that much. And because you had so many of these organizations that operated out of, you know, um, out of churches, and you, you know, you would have suffer, you, you would have like conventions in towns that were segregated. So, you know, Black women couldn't even come and stay in the hotel. So all kinds of practical uh, you know, bars as well as just, you know, cultural prejudice that made it difficult for the groups to work together. But I can't be that, I don't want to go too far because there may have been more cooperation than I'm aware of. And are you able to, any of you, to speak to um, how Newark compared to other parts of the, um, of the country uh, uh, in terms of uh, bootlegging volume or, or in enforcement? Um, well, it sounds like from the statistics Laura gave that New York was at the top of the list. Yeah. I mean, how do you, what are the, the source? You said 40 to 70 percent? Yeah, the FBI itself says it's at least 40 percent. And, you know, in the kind of 
newspaper memoirs, like quotes from like the, you know, the gangsters, they're saying, you know, anywhere between 60 to 70%. So even if you split the difference, half of illegal liquor is probably coming through uh, Newark. So it is kind of strange. And that's kind of what attracted me to the topic to begin with. Is how do we have the city that m at least 50% of all illegal liquor um, is running through primarily through Canada and Joe Reinfeld, um, but we don't know anything about it. And Longy is this, you know, criminal, you know, bigger than Al Capone in some ways. Well, nobody knows anything about him. Um, you know, I don't know if it's because it's New Jersey and because it, you know, is in the shadow of New York or they didn't get their crimes as visible in, you know, the press. Um, there's not as many murders. I, it's unclear as to why New York doesn't get as much press as it should um, and as much credit as it should for being such a wet and our politicians did not, you know, they're drinking at, you know, out in the street. So it's not, no one's hiding it. Well, it, Bob Burke is asking, were the Newark police involved in enforcement or was it primarily the federal team? It's primarily the federal team. Yeah, I mean, they're out on the streets, but it's primarily the federal team, which is why Ira Reeves becomes such like a, you know, focal point for law enforcement because he's one of the more, you know, visible faces. Um, but the turnover rate is about every nine months for a prohibition officer. So he was not he was not the only one that had a short stint. Uh, it's a tough job. And so uh, Guy Sterling points out that the police commissioner then was was um, Brennan, uh, William Brennan's father. How, what was um, uh, his role in all of this? Um, you don't see him mentioned very much in any of the, you know, any of the works on him. I mean, he exists, but there's nothing like that calls directly to him. Um, so I think it was a minimal police presence in, you know, these kinds of raids. Most of the time you see the federal agents, which, you know, they tried to kind of militarize, um, but they were kind of a, a ragtag group, you know, that, you know, were in a rotating door. So they weren't super effective, even if they wanted to be, which generally they weren't. Um, Michelle, I want to bring into the conversation and not just the uh, chat, this question about whether women really were in more danger from uh, their, their drunk husbands um, because they had less rights or, or was it sensationalized? Yeah, I wouldn't say it was sensationalized because, you know, nobody really talked about this before. It was um, obviously women were in a much more precarious position. You know, it was very difficult to get divorced. Um, women often didn't have rights to, you know, even money that they earned when they were married. And, you know, the temperance movement highlighted this and the way that they highlighted this lack of rights for women was by um, talking about husbands who didn't fulfill, you know, that duty to, you know, provide for the family. So it was especially useful to kind of highlight the man who would take his wife's, you know, uh, earnings and go spend it or where the children weren't um, provided for. Um, but they also very much talked about women, you know, getting, you know, uh, beaten by their husbands. Uh, and, and the interesting thing about that is the only other place you heard that sort of narrative was the Washingtonians who used that as almost a way to show the depths to which they had sunk, but were now sort of looking, you know, for forgiveness. I mean, some of their stories are really horrific. If you, you know, pay, the point is they're redeemed, but if you pay attention to what they did to their wives and children um, and now expect to be redeemed for that, um, at first, they were the only ones really talking about the, you know, the physical effects uh, on uh, women and children. Uh, the temperance movement, though, then starts highlighting this from the perspective of women. But, you know, that narrative of the Washingtonians does almost provide a way for men to be like, a, to offer an, you know, an explanation. I was so drunk, I never would have, you know, struck my wife who I love, you know, more than anything else. And, you know, a lot of men went into court with that, you know, the demon rum made me do such a thing looking to get sympathy. And Martin was, you know, quite good at that. Even though if you look, there's really this history. It wasn't this one occasion where he was drunk. You know, there was a history of him abusing his wife. Mm. Um, Rick Polshuk has asked, is that if any of you want to uh, talk about the difficulty of enforcing prohibition and the difficulty now of enforcing the 20 year, 21 year <laughs> drinking age, so. <laughs> or probably the difficulty of enforcing, uh, 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 you know, the marijuana laws and other things uh, until recently. I think those are good analogies. Good analogies. I don't yeah. have anything profound to say about it. I was uh, 20 when New Jersey raised it back to 21. I can point that out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm old enough that when I was in college in Texas, the drinking age was 18. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I was glad it was 18. Yeah, me too. Um, 
Gail Momgreen has pointed out that apparently quite a lot of alcohol was produced in Newark uh, during prohibition years as opposed, as opposed to imported drink. That large chemi were, uh, chemical factories were turned into stills. Uh, do you know anything about that or any, uh, any idea of the- Yeah, there was quite a lot of uh, wildcat breweries. So a bunch of, um, you know, different, you know, you would go into kind of a farmhouse and there would be a giant vat um, and they would be brewing all kinds of um, alcohol. They were also using uh, industrial alcohol and wood alcohol, which led to a lot of poisonings and deaths. Um, but you would see that, you know, Reeves and others would talk about, they would brew this kind of fake whiskey in these wildcat breweries and then, you know, make the, the counterfeit labels um, and then put them on and then sell it as real liquor. Um, and it would be a real, but you would find like, you know, rat feces floating in it or sometimes dead rats floating in the, the wildcat breweries. I mean, you wouldn't, I mean, drinking in prohibition, you know, it was, a risk for many reasons. And one was that you have no idea what was in those bottles or where it came from. And what, what's the story behind that, that photograph you showed of uh, changing the signs um, uh, from uh, denatured alcohol or, or to denature alcohol. Yeah, because they were people were making their own alcohol and they would be advertising it as the kind of legal alcohol that you would need for like industrial equipment. Um, so he would go around to try to say you need to be, you know, explicit in the type of alcohol you were selling. But generally they were selling it from, you know, every which way, making it in all kinds of different places. It was real adventurous. Well, good. If you, uh, a final comment from each of you and then we'll wrap it up. Um, if you if you would like a final comment, uh, no, I don't, I don't think I need a final comment. <laughs> I think it was a nice. I think it, yeah, these are great presentations uh, and uh, good questions. So yeah, and it sure makes me hope for when we can all gather again in person and, yes. and somehow have live streaming so that people can join from a distance, but we can also um, engage with each other in in, in, in person. We're hoping that we have we a drink together. <laughs> We have a, a, a series of, um, of six programs planned. We'll get word out to everybody on the uh, Newark History Society list, uh, three of which uh, we hope to do in cooperation with NJ PAC. Uh, but this is uh, uh, Laura and Michelle and George. This is really a great way to uh, close out a, a, a difficult year, but where we continue to discuss uh, uh, Newark and it's, it's always fascinating history. Uh, thank you so much. And I'm going to turn it, uh, turn it back to Najia now. Hi, thank you, Tim. Uh, thank you, Michelle and Laura and George. This was another amazing uh, panel. I just want to say thank you to everyone who attended tonight. Uh, you guys were so engaged and uh, great questions. Uh, so I'm um, just so grateful uh, for Tim and North History Society and our uh, continued partnership. And so we are looking forward to uh, the future and to a new season uh, to continue to do this. It's been a phenomenal year. Uh, we're just so grateful uh, to be a part of the North History Society uh, a series uh, where we get to be well informed of what was happening here in the city because we know uh, we need to know our history if we need to know where we're going, right? So again, thank you, Tim and panelists. Uh, I also wanna say again, thank you to ADP who is our official uh, uh, sponsor for community engagement here at NJPAC. Please uh, look out on our website, njpack.org, for all the latest happenings. Uh, I want to let you guys know uh, to please follow us on Facebook and uh, Twitter and Instagram. You'll see some great reopening campaign videos that will, we think will may, uh, brighten your spirits. Um, we are um, having talks of reopening, so we encourage you to go there and uh, watch the videos, enjoy them, and share them. And so again, we say thank you uh, for tonight, and we'll see you next time. Have a good one. Thanks. Good night. Night.